welcome. Welcome to Let's Talk Liberty. I hope you're doing well. Praise the Lord. Who do we have on here? Hey, what's up, Facebook? Good to see you. Hey, Amanda. Hey, YouTube. Rumble. Let me know where you're watching from. Let me know how you're doing. It's going to be a good night. Hey, Gloria. What's up, sister? Um, <laughs> we're going TikTok live. Come on. This can only mean one thing. Bruce. <laughs> Bruce is coming. Oh, I hope so. I hope we'll see Brother Bruce on tonight. Got a good feeling about him. He's coming around for sure. Let me get a thumbnail here. All right. On break, praise God. Um, I'm going to get the um, you, uh, TikTok set up because I want to be able to put it on the screen. So let me do that right now. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you so much, Lord, for everybody you send into the broadcast tonight. Father, I submit my life to you. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name. There we go. That seems to be working. Send the right people tonight, Father, and touch them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let tonight be filled with your glory. Yeesh. You don't want to accidentally, when you go to TikTok, you don't want to accidentally, you know, watch any videos. <laughs> that place is a nightmare. All right, let's see here. With iPhone, let's get this set up here. Who's ready? We're going to name this How to Save the World. And hopefully that'll be good. You guys know the drill. If you're watching on Facebook and YouTube and Rumble and DLive. If you're watching this replay, um, feel free to join us for the live broadcast. I know I'm not hitting like a consistent time each night, so you'll have to go to one of the platforms and turn on notifications. You know, YouTube, you hit that bell or whatever. And um, But we would love your support live because when we go out into the deep waters of TikTok land, it can be a little dicey. <laughs> All right. And I'm okay with it. I'm okay going alone. You know, I've done it a lot of times. But it is nice to have some brothers and sisters on there. Praise God. Especially knowing that I have people praying. That's, that helps. Okay, Your prayers matter. So you can watch this for entertainment. That's fine. I'm not mad at you or something. But if you actually partner in prayer, we'll see people saved. We're not just winning arguments. We're winning souls. We're not here to prove anything to people on TikTok. We want their souls to enter the kingdom of God. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world, but forfeit his soul? So please share in carrying this burden with me. It's a delight, by the way. When I say burden, I mean specifically the compassion for lost people. People are lost without hope, without direction, without the word of God. And so maybe it's just my story. Maybe it's because I was lost for so long that I, like evangelism's just in my blood because I remember what it was like to be completely lost. And if you don't, let's say you grew up in the church, let me just tell you, it sucks. The kingdom of darkness is total deception. And those who really, really embrace the kingdom of darkness. See, there's a lot of the world who just kind of sits on the fence You'll see that a lot in these TikTok groups. They kind of live a normal life, right? They're not, they basically just ride the fence. They don't want to decide either way. They don't really want to live fully convinced of anything. They just like to be an infinite skeptic and just kind of sit back and pick on other people for, for actually believing in something. I'm not talking about those people. I mean, they're hard to reach. You know, usually they're impossible to reach because they don't want to be reached. They're, they're, their heart's hardened. I don't give up on them, though, because sometimes 
it just takes time. In my story, it took time. It took years. And um, specifically, when I met Sam, who led me to the Lord, it was, it was at least eight months of just constant dialogue where I was attacking, very skeptical, very aggressive, and he was responding with good answers and uh, the love of Christ, which really surpasses all understanding, right? So just remember what we're doing here and remember that you play a role. So if you're watching this on YouTube or Facebook right now, please don't think this is just entertainment. While it is entertaining, and I hope it'll edify you and I hope you'll be blessed, I'd really appreciate your partnership, okay? Um, I can actually feel the difference. I know that sounds kind of weird, but you can feel the prayers of the saints. And um, I, I don't know how to explain that. You can just, you, it's an increased anointing. It's an increased encouragement. It's like, it's like in the spiritual realm, people are lifting up your arms and they're standing with you. So um, without further ado, let's hop on. But just please keep that, those things in mind as you're watching. And as you see specific people, especially people whose hearts are softened, just go after them in prayer. Start to, start to just bind anything that would deceive them, any darkness that's over them. You might say, well, how do I pray? Let's say somebody named Jennifer is on and they're asking questions, but they're not hostile. They're actually interested in truth. You can begin to say, Father, I thank you for Jennifer right now in Jesus' name. I curse all deception off her life. Any, any wickedness that's trying to cloud her judgment, that's trying to keep her in a place of darkness, we curse in Jesus' name. You, just, you can just begin to to clear in the spirit those things that are keeping her bound. You can begin to clear in the spirit those things. You're, you're, you have great authority in Christ and you can use that authority. And I can't see every comment. I can't focus on everything going on. So this is where like the partnership matters. But we can begin to take serious ground together. What an awesome time to be alive with this technology. Seriously, guys, what an awesome time. This is, the, this is the end time harvest and the Lord's given us this technology. The enemy might have intended it for evil with pornography and all the other wickedness, but the Lord will use it for good. We'll reach millions of people with the gospel of Jesus Christ before the rapture, which is imminent, by the way. But before that happens, there's going to be a massive, it's already happening now, it's just going to accelerate. You're going to see an acceleration, especially as the systems of the flesh crumble. As economies tank, as currencies crash, you're, you're going to see a massive rev, uh, revival and harvest. <clears throat> Remember, a revival is happening within the church. People, It's revived, so something that once was alive is coming back to life again. That's revival. But harvest is new souls coming in. <clears throat> okay, so that's where we're at. Praise God. Let's get it. Ah, let's get it going. How to save the world. I'm going to pray in the Holy Ghost for a few minutes just to get my uh, my soul right. Ha-ra-shin-de-son-bon-gon-di-o-ron-di-a-da-ba-sa-ba-she-she-she-bo-bo-bo-se. <laughs> Hara siangi ande bondi anda la ramando siande si 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 bo 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 se ramangande on bondi anda rabasi shidia ramangondi anda rabasa. Father, thank you that you're drawing people right now. You're drawing people to open up the app, Lord, and to be drawn to this broadcast in Jesus' name, Father. Draw souls, Lord. Let them experience your love. Let them experience your goodness. Grant them repentance that would lead to a knowledge of the truth, Father. For your glory, let your word go forth with power and demonstrate with your Holy Spirit the power of God, miracles, signs, and wonders. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Hey, Tic Tac. We'll wait. We'll get some people online. And... Um, if you jump on TikTok, feel free to share the broadcast. And, uh, of course, you can uh, ask questions today. We're going to try to get the questions right away and have some callers on. As always, we love bringing people on, making new friends. So we'll be doing that as well. And I got a, a, a fun message, one of my favorite messages to share. 
And uh, I was going to say, hey, what's up, Patriot? What's up, C-Man? What's up, Kyle? Mr. Jewel. Hey, Seeking God 27. God bless you. Hey, Brent. Great, great to see you. What's up, Jacob Wood? Hey, Nancy. Sorry if I missed your name. A lot of them are coming in right now. Hey, what's up, guys? God bless you. Hey, share this broadcast if you could on TikTok. Well, let's get the word out and get some people in the room. We're going to start in just a second. What's up? God bless you. Hey, I see you. Yeah. All right. Hey, welcome. Welcome, TikTok. Hey, Michael. Good to see you. Hey, Kevin. God bless you. Hey, Curtis Hayes. All right. All right. We're going to get started. Tonight, I'm going to share a message called How to Save the World. And you can actually apply this. You know, you, you might be saying, well, I don't really care how to save the world. Well, you can apply this to your own life, to your own soul. But you can also apply this to your key relationships. Okay. So marriage, if you're married, this will really help you. Okay, because you're you know if you're if especially if your marriage is on the rocks, if you're experiencing hey what's up everybody I see you thanks for the shares, I see you joining TikTok God bless you. Especially if your marriage is on the rocks, let's say you're in a or let's say your boyfriend or girlfriend or whoever let's say you're in a relationship that's struggling right now. <laughs> Daniel, what's up? Jesus and then pizza, bam, mic drop, boom. It's good stuff. You're right. I mean, I can't argue with that. You you brought some significant wisdom to the conversation. So we can pretty much leave and go home. Daniel's Daniel's nailed it. Hey, what's up, man? God bless you, homie. I like that. Shalomi, my homie. I like you already. Yeah, so we're going to get started. But yeah, you're, you're right. It is Jesus. But there's going to be, I'm going to take an angle to this that's going to really help. Because a lot of people say, even the word grace... Hey, what's up? What's wrong with dad? He called me Flanders. You're going to make me blush, man. You old dog, you. Know how to get to it. Get to your, your friend here. <laughs> Seriously, Carl. That's what I've been calling you, Carl. We're going to be good friends. I can tell. I can feel it. What's up, Carl? Hey, man. Oh. All right, let's get started. I trust in the Lord. Praise the Lord. Wonderful. Thanks for being here. Hope you'll stick around. It's going to be a short broadcast, and we'll take some questions, okay? We always like to do this. Now that we got 128 in the room, we'll get started. Okay, so... <laughs> back at it again, right? Uh, hey, what's up, Tyler? Hospice chaplain from Kentucky. Praise God. Thanks for, your, thanks for all your work. That's a wonderful line of work. And I pray that you'll have great grace in these, uh, in these last days we're living in and love many people into the kingdom. Let's go. Okay, so how to, how to save the world. Now, okay, Daniel, I would love to take you on for Q&A. Please uh, stick around. It will be a pretty short time. It's a short message today. Okay. Well, I say that. We'll see how the, what the Holy Ghost wants to do. Um, how to save the world. Okay, so I'm going to start by actually uh, in the context of marriage. And so some of you are on here. You're saying, well, I'm not married. I don't, I don't understand what you're, you know, that, how does this relate to me? Uh, but you're going to see because when you when you look at a human relationship like marriage, these principles become immediately clear, and then you can scale these, and it actually is it's actually how you save the entire world. So while it works on your most intimate, important relationship, like on that level, it also works on a universal, global level as well. All right. So um, if you let's say you're not married, but you have a boyfriend or girlfriend, this will still help you. Or if you want to be married one day, this will help you. And then again, I'm going to apply. I'm going to first start with the with the micro example, and then we're going to go to the macro picture and look at how uh, God saved the world. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Right? We all know the the gospel. If you don't know the gospel, I'm going to share it today. But first, let's look at a marriage. So, when I got married to my wife, my beautiful bride. Right now we have five beautiful children and we have a marriage that's filled with bliss and joy and mutual honor and, and passion. It's just, it's, it's thriving. It's really good. But it wasn't always like that. In fact, and we were Christians, by the way, so it wasn't just like being a Christian solved this problem because we weren't actually engaging this, this uh, principle. Okay, so I wanna, I'm going to teach it to you and I hope you'll receive this because it'll change your life. I'm telling you, this will change everything about your life. And the word that I want you to, if you're taking notes or if you're trying to write something down or tuck something in your heart, the word is grace. But we're going to go over what grace is and how to apply it. And then 
I'm going to show you how this saves the world. Okay, so grace is giving someone what they don't deserve, specifically giving some something good when the person doesn't deserve it. Okay, of course, mercy is giving, uh, so, you know, not giving something that they do deserve. So if, so if somebody deserves punishment or if they deserve judgment and you withhold that and you give them or you don't give them that punishment or judgment, that's mercy, right? So and, and, and for our discussion, they're going to be the same thing. Okay, basically, it's treating people well, even when they don't deserve it. All right, now, how does this save the world and how does this save your marriage? Well, let's look at the marriage first. So my wife and I got married. And it's very, um, the natural way, right? There's a supernatural realm. That's God's environment or his, um, his arena. We call that spirit, okay? And then there's this natural realm. We call that flesh. Now, to set the mind on the flesh, the Bible says, is death. But to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. So we all want life and peace, amen? That's what we're all going for on earth. That's what everybody's looking for is life and peace. And so how do you do it? Well, you set your mind on the spirit. Well, how do things operate in the spiritual realm, in the higher realm? Remember, God says, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. But in the new covenant, we're told that we have what's called the mind of Christ. We actually have the spirit of God. So we can live by the spirit. We can access that higher wisdom from heaven. So in the old covenant, in the, in the old days, they didn't have this ability. Only one or two prophets would have the spirit of the Lord come on them. But everybody else was stuck in this arena called the flesh, this natural, uh, this natural zone. Well, what is that natural zone like? Well, do good, get good. Do bad, get bad. If you treat me wrong, I'm going to remember it, and I'm going to treat you wrong in return. In a marriage, let's say your spouse or your or your boyfriend or girlfriend, whoever you know, whoever your significant other is, let's say they do something wrong. The natural mind, this is the flesh. The flesh wants to first get offended and then show them the wrong they did. Sometimes you're actually trying to help, right? You you want them to correct their behavior because you don't want them to keep making that mistake. And so the flesh strategy is to hold up what I would call a mirror, which is really the law. We'll get there in a second. You hold up a mirror and you show them that mistake. You, you, you tell them about the mistake. Let's say your husband's not thoughtful. So all you wives out there, let's say he, he doesn't uh, think about you. You know, you really just want him to think about you, amen? You just, you just want him to care. You just want to, him to express his love to you. And is it so much just to, just to tell me, that you love me? Is it so much just to call and check on me? Maybe do the dishes? Maybe maybe pick up your laundry? Is it so much just to, just to express your love to me? To show me you care? Well, the natural way of dealing with that within a marriage is to tell him, hey, could you just pick up your laundry? Hey, you know, do you mind doing the dishes every now and then? <laughs> hey, you know, would it be so hard if you just tell me? And you mean well, you're trying to help the person, but you're engaging in a strategy called flesh where you're pointing out their mistake or their fault. You're bringing to their attention where they fell short or where they messed up, okay? Does that make sense? So this is flesh. Now, this strategy, the Bible calls law. Law, the Old Covenant, the Ten Commandments, is a mirror that reveals where you fall short. But guess what? That mirror might show you the pimple on your face, but it doesn't help you clean the pimple. It just shows you there's a problem. And the Bible actually teaches that this mere strategy, this fleshly strategy, when, every time you hear law, think flesh. Every time you hear grace, think spirit. We're going to get there in a second. But that's how Galatians lets us know that the flesh is going under the law. That's what the flesh is. And of course, we know all the fruit of the flesh, all the lust and pornography and all the adultery and hate and all that stuff that, are, I'm sorry, the works of the flesh that come out of that system. But it starts with self-awareness in trying to be righteous on your own. That's what the law is. It's a system of attaining righteousness through your works. So it's awareness of where I did right and where I did wrong. It'll lead to pride, which is the mother of all sins, but it leads to all other sins as well. The Bible actually teaches that the strength of sin is the law. In other words, when that commandment comes that says you shouldn't steal, imagine this, you're in a room and uh, there's a hundred doors and they're all beautiful doors and you're sitting in this room, you're enjoying a sandwich and then somebody comes up and says, hey, whatever you do, don't touch that door. And he points to a door that has like a red, like pulsing, you know, light over it. Guess what happens in you? All of a sudden you have this really strong desire to know, I want to go into that door. 
<laughs> I'd like to touch that door. Okay, that's the law. When the law comes in, it grows sin in the flesh, and, and then of course sin brings death. Now, this is in marriage what this feels like. You're, you come home from a long day's work, you're a husband, and your wife gives you what you do deserve, and it's negative, right? Maybe you forgot to call her. Maybe you forgot to pick up something. Maybe you weren't as thoughtful. Maybe maybe the first thing you did when you came in is sat down and just took a break instead of help her with the kids or the dishes. And what she does is in the flesh, she tells you, hey, could you just help? Hey, could you just do this? And what she's doing is she's pointing out your flaw. She's holding up that mirror and showing you your flaw. But if you're if you've been married, when that happens, what happens in your heart? Obviously, it's hard. It makes things heavy. It makes the marriage seem like poisonous. You start feeling like, oh, gosh. And it actually grows disobedience. It actually grows sin. So how do you save the marriage? Well, we do marriage counseling, and we help marriages get strong and healthy in the Lord. And the, the strategy is grace. What do I mean? If you see your spouse falling short, right? If you see that your spouse is supposed to live at this level, but for whatever reason, they're down here. You're not in your spouse's life to condemn them and make them feel bad. You're in your spouse's life to come underneath them and lift them up in encouragement. So let's say he is not that thoughtful. Let's say he didn't take out the garbage. Let's say he didn't do his laundry or whatever the case may be, and you see him living at that lower level. If you point out that he's at the lower level, it's going to bring him further down. But if you start to encourage and lift up and love him and give him grace, again, what he doesn't deserve, he doesn't deserve a compliment. He actually deserves judgment. But you give him a compliment. Honey, I love you so much. I'm so grateful to be your wife. Or for husbands, baby, you're so awesome. I'm so I'm so blessed to be your husband. I'm so blessed to be married to you. You're such an awesome woman of God. That Those words of grace lift the person up so that they can come back to the level where they're supposed to be. This is how you save a marriage is you give the, the spouse the good they don't deserve and you withhold from the spouse the negative that they do deserve in other words grace and mercy you give just like the gospel god when we were yet in sin christ died for us we did not deserve salvation we did not deserve god's favor or his blessing or his love no we were in active rebellion against god we deserved hell but christ how did he save the world he gave us grace, the man filled with grace and truth. He came in the middle of our sin, in the middle of our rebellion, and this is how you save the world. Now, let me put this into per some perspective for you, because you might be saying, okay, I kind of get this grace thing, but like, how far does it go? Well, let me tell you a story from my marriage that'll help you really put some meat on these bones. And I told this this morning in our morning broadcast, and I pray it'll help you. When we first got married, I was so in love with Sonia. I mean, she she is so beautiful and she's so wonderful. And I, I just was like, man, I totally like, I scored, you know. She's like way out of my league. Praise God, you know. And one day we sat on a bed. I, this was two or three weeks into the marriage. Now, a little backstory. I had been a Christian for many years. And I had been delivered from, from, from lust in particular and pornography for some time. So I just, I didn't have the desire anymore. I didn't, I never did it. And it just wasn't a part of my life. It wasn't really a temptation. Okay. I was free from that temptation for some time and I was married and I was happily married. And my wife sat down and she said, listen, I can forgive you for everything except for adultery. And in my, in my heart, I said, well, no problem, baby. Cause I'll never cheat on you. I'm, I'm with you forever. I'm, I'm totally sold out to this covenant. I don't. It's not even a desire of my heart to go and find another spouse. And so what I said was just like, no problem. I love you, and, and you don't have to worry about that. You know what's interesting? The next week, I struggled with lust. And I hadn't struggled with lust for years. So I was really confused, and I, and I was really tormented because I don't want those thoughts in my head. I don't want lust coming into my mind. And I was really like, what's going on? So I started to seek the Lord. And he showed me from the gospel, the moment you have that one condition, it's an open door for the devil to come and attack you. And this is why the cross of Jesus Christ is so powerful, because it publicly humiliated the devil and took away the devil's power. What's the devil's power? Condemnation. What is condemnation? 
guilt and shame because of how you have acted. Okay, so let, let me just back this up. The, the way the Lord uh, showed me to teach this is imagine a military base in Congo, Africa. And you're the leader of this military base. And you have a north and a south and an east and a west fortified wall structure. And you have a general in Europe that you're communicating with over a, 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 over some kind of a, a communications system. Okay, so you're doing phone calls or whatever to this general. And you right now have a weak spot on your south side. Okay, so you're, you're well fortified on your north, on your east, and on your west. Like, no enemy no enemies getting in. But on the south side, you have a blind spot. There's like a, there's like a problem. And you call the general, and you're telling the general about that weak spot. Well, it's as if the enemy is listening into your call and knows exactly how to attack you. When you put a condition on your marriage, oh, I'll do this as long as this person does this. The enemy knows exactly how to attack your marriage. The enemy knows exactly what door to come in. And so the what's the solution? Don't put a condition. So I came back to Sonia and I said, listen, baby, I know this is crazy, but I believe we have to be completely sold out to this marriage unconditionally. And I said, I'll start. I said, baby, no matter what happens, you can cheat on me. You can try to run from me. You can hate my guts. You can treat me terribly. I am forever committed to you regardless of what you do, regardless of what you want, regardless of what you say. I love you and it's a decision and I'm committed to this covenant forever, no matter what. Now, when I did that, guess what? It took away all the power of the enemy to bring in tempt temptation and condemnation. And so I would encourage, and this is what Jesus did when he took away the sin of the world. What, G what sins did Jesus die for? All of man and women's sins, mankind's sins, all of the sin. He who knew no sin became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So he literally, there, that's why Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those of us in Christ Jesus. You see, the moment you are born again and you put your trust in Jesus, you have righteousness before God and you have peace with God having been justified by faith. And it removes the devil's ability to attack you because the devil uses condemnation. He's the accuser of the brethren. He first gives you the temptation, and then he backs off, and he hits you in the head and says, oh, you call yourself a Christian, thinking like that, acting like that. So how do you save your marriage? It's grace. You give your spouse a blank check, an in, a unconditional, I'm, I'm forever committed to you. I'll only be a helper to you. I'm not here to point out your flaws. I'm here to help you. I'm not here to push you down. I'm here to lift you up. If I see you're having a bad day and you start yelling at me and being mean to me, I'll realize you need help. You don't need condemnation. I don't need to yell back at you and start and start giving you a hard time. Actually, you're communicating through your actions that you need help from me. So I'm going to say, baby, how can I help you? I'm going to go low. I'm going to go humble and let grace flow through me to build you up. I'm not going to push you down further. You're already in trouble. Amen. This is how you save a marriage. If both spouses catch this revelation, first of all, if one spouse catches this revelation, the marriage is saved. It's impossible to have a divorce if even one of the members catches this. But if both catch this, now you have a blessed marriage where both people are outdoing one another in love and it becomes so sweet. It becomes so passionate. It becomes so filled with the love of God, the fire of God. Amen. So this is how you save a marriage. It's how you save the world. How did God choose to save the world? He made it not dependent on man at all. You see, there's a covenant right now called the new covenant. It's between God the Father and God the Son. And we are brought into that covenant by trusting in Jesus, not because, not by working. We don't climb into that covenant. We don't work our way. We don't keep that covenant through our good, good works. No, we believe in Jesus and he is the one who's faithful to bring to completion the good work he starts in us. So the moment we believe, we become born again. We're new creatures in Christ. All the old things are gone and everything has been made new. And now we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Remember, salvation is not a ticket you hold on to that one day you're going to get those pearly pearly gates and say, hey, Peter, I, I, I'm still got my, my ticket. Can I get in? That's not salvation. Salvation is not something that you can drop and lose 
No, salvation is a rebirth. It's a new birth by the Spirit of God. And remember, everything that's born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. The moment you, this is what salvation is. It's not that ticket that you might drop, that you might lose, that you might slip out of your hand. No, it's a new heart. It's a new nature. You actually become a butterfly. You were a caterpillar. Boom, you become a butterfly. Guess what? Even if you go and act like a caterpillar again, you're not a caterpillar. Okay? You're a butterfly. And even if you're confused and you go back to the flesh, the flesh has been crucified with Christ. It's no longer you who live, but Christ who lives in you. This is the mystery that's been revealed. Christ in us, the hope of glory. So this, the, the, the Christian understands rightly from the scriptures that salvation is not something that you have to do a lot to keep. It's, you, didn't, you didn't earn it in the first place. You don't have the power to keep it. And if you're trusting yourself to keep your salvation, oh, you're going to live on shifting sand. Do you really think you have what it takes? No, but if you'll ask Jesus, if you'll look to Jesus, guess what? His name is Savior, and he's perfect at his job. He's perfect at saving you. He'll save you to the uttermost. Don't build your life asking questions like, am I good enough to be saved? Build your life asking questions like, is Christ good enough to save me? See, that's peace with God when you trust in Jesus. Don't trust in your own ability. Trust in his ability to save you. That's where you'll have peace with God. He cannot fail. He's perfect in every way. Now, you might be saying, well, are you, are you teaching people that they can just go on sinning? No. What I'm saying is that once you're actually born again, your new nature as a butterfly will eventually realize that you are righteous and you'll act like it. Even if you take a season and you're confused, this was my life, I was confused, I went back and I tried to run back into sin as a Christian, but guess what? I couldn't enjoy sin anymore because I had a new heart and my new heart was flowing, the desires of God were flowing out of my new heart. So even though I tried to run back into sin, I couldn't get drunk anymore. I mean, it was just, it was a terrible experience. I couldn't get high anymore. It was a terrible experience. I couldn't watch pornography anymore. It was, just, it was like, oh, what's happening? Because I was a new creature. I was a sheep. I was still acting like a pig. I was playing in the mud, but I didn't really like the mud anymore because I was a sheep. I was new. So even if you try, a real Christian is a born again, new creature in Christ. Okay. John says like this, those who left us were never really of us. There's people that hang out in church for decades and they never actually are born again. They never receive Christ. They never receive a new nature. They're still dead in sin in Adam. They need to be born again in righteousness in Christ. But once you are born again, behold, you are a new creature in Christ, okay? And you're seated in heavenly places, hidden in God, in Christ Jesus, sealed with the Holy Spirit. Do you think the Holy Spirit's going to drop you? No, the, the Bible says the Father won't let one out of his hand. He's faithful to save you to the uttermost. What am I saying here? It, when God wanted to save the world, he gave you grace, which means there's no ability for you to mess up his favor towards you. Now, if you're on this broadcast and you haven't received Jesus, you're going to hell. And I'm not trying to be mean. I'm saying there's no other way to the Father except through Jesus. Jesus is the door to heaven. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by Jesus. But the sin of the world is not adultery, it's not murder. Those are all sins, but guess what? All those sins were taken away in the body of Jesus. You know what the sin of the world is, according to the scriptures? Unbelief in Jesus. Not trusting in Christ is the sin that lands people in hell. Rejecting God's gift of salvation. Remember, God is love. Love does not force you. Love simply pursues you and offers you, but love honors your free choice. So love looks out for you more than themselves, right? Love puts you in front of themselves. So love's not going to rape you, right? That's not love. Love's not going to force you against your will. Love will do everything. Love will die for you. Love will lay, lay down his life for you. But you still have to pick up that gift called Christ's salvation. You still have to receive that gift. And I'm here to tell you, friend, if you're watching this, if you've made it this far, it's so easy to receive that gift. All you have to do in your heart is you just have to want it. You just have to want to be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. 
And then in your heart, you believe, trust unto righteousness, and with your mouth you confess unto salvation. What does that look like? Father, I want Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Jesus, cleanse me with your blood. Forgive me of all my sin. Fill me with your spirit. In Jesus' name. It's a very simple prayer. Pray it with all your heart. Lord, come into my life. Make me new. I trust in Jesus. The moment you do that, the Bible says your heart of stone is ripped out and a soft heart made after the image of God is put on the inside of you. Okay, and then, and then from there, you'll start having new desires. All of a sudden, you'll be interested in what this book says. You know, I was an atheist for 21 years. I would have told you this is some weird, dusty old book that men wrote to control other people. It's just a, a money-making scheme. You know, there's, but then once I got born again, guess what? I was like, this is interesting. What's this all about? And then it became real to me. It was life to me. It actually spoke to the deepest parts of my soul and helped me. Okay, it was a living word. So yeah, if you're, if you're not a Christian, this is going to seem ridiculous. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. And so I invite you today, if you've never trusted in Jesus Christ, you will stand before God. And there's two kinds of people. There's those that stand in their own righteousness and say, I deserve heaven. And there's those that say, I know I sin and fall short. I know I deserve hell, but I, I am sorry for my sin. I repent of my sin and I trust in the Lamb of God. I trust in Jesus Christ alone, not in my good works. I don't bring a bunch of good works to God and say, accept me. No, I bring my Lamb and I say, Jesus is the only hope for my salvation. Forgive me because of what Jesus has done, not because of what I deserve. Deal with me according to the lamb, not according to my sin. There's only two kinds of people. Please be the second kind of person that recognizes you need a savior and cries out on the name of the Lord. And the Bible says if you do that, you will be saved. But it's got to be your whole heart. You got to get you got to be totally sold out that look, I don't want uh, I don't want to live in the flesh. I want that thing dead and I want to come into the spiritual life in Christ. If you'll do that, God is faithful. You'll go through this experience and it will change everything about your life. That's my presentation for the day. So how do you save your marriage? It's grace. Giving what people what they don't deserve. How did God save the world? Grace. Giving people what they don't deserve. When Jesus hung on that cross, he was sitting there looking at the very people that killed him. And guess what he said? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Wow, what a savior. The love of God poured out on people who didn't deserve it. This is the message that saves the world, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, we'll take some questions. Um, if you're on and you want to jump on the broadcast, of course you can. You just got to hit that multi-group, multi-guest button down there, and I can I can let you on. I believe I get notified when that happens. Um, so please, uh, you know, if you want to do that, you certainly can. And I'll take some questions. If you have, if you know, feel free to ask whatever you want. I'll do my best to answer, but remember, you know, So outbreak, you know, I hear you, but the idea is you, you, you're mocking God. But see, God right now, he's not holding the sin of the world against you. You're in a period. There's a time where if you'd said the same thing, you'd get, you'd be destroyed. But right now, you're in an age called grace where he's not holding your sin again. Right now, in this moment, he's not mad at you. He That sin that you're doing right now, you're blaspheming against a holy God, which is a big sin, by the way. It's a big sin. Um, no, I didn't steal the book, Carl. Stop asking me that question. I don't know. <laughs> What's your point? You can't steal a gift. If somebody gives you something, it's not stolen. Ask different questions. Come on, I know you have more to say. I love you. Look, you're, 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 you're blaspheming against a holy God. Right. And it, it's, a, it's In the old co covenant, you'd have been struck down dead. That's how serious this is. But right now, God... The, the sin of the world, even your sin today and your sin tomorrow and your sin the next day, all of that sin has been removed. It's been taken. Remember, Jesus became sin. He took, when John saw, John the Baptist saw Jesus, he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So the only sin right now that remains, the only condemnation is when you don't trust in Jesus. When you don't trust in Jesus, you stand condemned already. The wrath of God abides over you. You don't want to stay there. Receive the mercy and grace of God. 
Larry, hey, good to see you. Uh, we're non-denominational, but I would say we're in an age, what's even cooler, we're in an age of great unity where you're going to start to see denominations torn down and unity come back as the Spirit of the Lord and the glory of the Lord covers the earth. You're going to see a lot of the destructive divisions in the body of Christ start to come down, especially as the common enemy becomes stronger it always unifies the forces, right? So like, let's say aliens attacked Earth like an Independence Day. Guess what? Russia and China, United States, all the militaries would all of a sudden be on the same team, right? Because the common enemy is strong. Well, that's the same story we're going to see the, over these coming months and years is Christians are going to band together because what, what unites us is so much more important than what divides us. We trust in Jesus. <laughs> you know, Our smaller tertiary issues, I and mean, they're important. I'm not saying they're not important, but they're not they're not important enough to be divided. Amen. So, Pastafarian. All right. Thanks for that. Hallelujah. Agreed. God is as real as Will, as a Will Smith movie with aliens. Hey, you're back to, to Tyrannosaurus Rex. Back to contribute some high-level intellectual stuff. I always appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right, guys. If you have any questions, I'd love to answer them. As non-denominational, non how do you feel about the Catholic Church? Hey, Larry, great question again. And I like your name, by the way, Larry Longpock. It's pretty cool. So um, I have some wonderful Catholic friends that are definitely born-again Christians, okay? Um, so I'm not uh, here to, to uh, denounce Catholicism or anything like that. I, I don't know. I, I've, I have done some study into Catholicism. I was even on my way to becoming a Catholic at one point because I was convinced that Peter was the first pope. And I was really like interested in that whole apostolic authority thing and, and secession. And uh, anyway, I as I got into Catholicism, I personally was convicted not to depart from the gospel of grace to a system of law. That's what I personally experienced. I'm not saying all Catholics have to experience that. But as I was starting to touch that system, it was Mount Sinai. It was law. It was it was a, a it was a step in the wrong direction. Once you've tasted the grace of God, I'm not going back to the law. It's like Galatians, right? I'm not I'm not going to go back to be perfected in the flesh once I've tasted of the Spirit, right? So that's my own personal experience. And again, I'm not saying every Catholics could sit here right in front of me and say, well, that's not what I've experienced. And I would say, praise God, if Catholics can go under that system and remain in grace in the Spirit, I say, praise God. Muslims, that's a great question as well. We talk about this a lot. The only two worldviews on earth that provide the necessary preconditions for rational thought, argumentation, objective morality, are Christianity and Islam. And obviously you can say Judaism, but I'm, a, I, I'm obviously a Christian, so I'm assuming that Christianity is, is Judaism. We've, we followed Moses. The law killed us so that we could be married to Messiah, and we're in the new covenant now. So just I'm going to go ahead and assume we, we're worshiping Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, so two worldviews that could possibly be true based on their philosophical, epistemological frameworks alone. A revealed word of God from an all-knowing creator, an all-powerful creator. Every other worldview is internally inconsistent and has all sorts of problems, okay? Now, looking at Christianity versus Islam, I would say one's God, one's the devil. And the way I would do that is through looking at the fruit, okay? Do you feel like the NLV Bible was changed to fit people's needs today? That's a good question. Hold on one second. So, yeah, in my understanding of Hinduism is there's there's massive problems by by their uh, in, in terms of philosophy. Now, I'd have to look back into my notes, so forgive me. I don't want to speak out of ignorance here. But it's my understanding that Hinduism has massive internal conflicts and on a philosophical level. But to answer your question about Islam before I get too far off the beaten path here, one of those faith systems says if you want to fully embrace the Quran and, and the Allah of the Quran, then you need to lay down your life to destroy the enemies of Allah in something called jihad. Okay, that's one of them. The other one says if you want to fully embrace the God of the Bible, then you will lay down your life to save those who don't even deserve it. Now, to me, one of those is love and one of those is demonic. Okay, one of those is demonically inspired. That comes from the devil. One of those comes from the heart of God. God is love. Okay, so you're going to bank your eternity on something. The God of the Bible is love, agape love. And he wrote our hearts. He designed our hearts to know the love of God that surpasses knowledge. 
What does that mean? When you see someone lay down their life, if you were looking out of a street window and you saw one guy who had bombs all over his body and he ran into a preschool and he detonated himself, something in you should say, that was wrong. Right, something in you, on your heart, even if you're not a believer, should say that was evil. But now, if you look out the same street window, you're at the you're at, you're you're watching from the fourth story, and you see a street down, and you see a little a, a homeless man walking across the street, and he's confused, and then you see a bus driver that's that's barreling down the road, and they're on their cell phone distracted, and then you see a a businessman look up, and he realizes he's on the cell phone, he realizes oh that guy's about to kill that guy, and he throws his phone down, and he pushes the homeless man out of the way, and he gets hit and killed. Something in you is going to say. That was beautiful. That was good. That was true. You see, Christ is written on our hearts. The love of God is written on our hearts. So to the, to the person in Islam, I would say, I understand that you have an intellectual worldview. I understand that it works. But is it the truth? Is it the love of God? Do you want to bank your eternity and worship the Allah of the Quran? No, only one God deserves worship, and that is the God of the Bible, agape love. God is love. Amen. So that would be my answer to that. I hope that helps. Outbreak Jeep. Sorry, I didn't see your question. I'm a Christian, but what would you say to people who say that the Bible condemns slavery and genocide? That the Bible condones, sorry, slavery and genocide. That's a great question. So, and then Tyrannosaurus Rex has a question, which I, I usually don't answer his questions because he's hilarious, but I will answer this one, and I'll answer the other one as well. There was one more that came in about um, NLV. You know, Larry, to be to be totally transparent, I don't do a ton of research into the different translations. I personally love the King James and New King James. I spent a lot of time in Blue Letter Bible looking at the original Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic because I just I find it super fruitful to dig in and find cross references and and, and the actual root of the word personally. So. Um, not saying you have to do that. I think all translations can probably be helpful, but there's also some things that I've seen in some translations where I'm like, what are they doing? They totally missed the gospel. And then I go and check it in the original language and I say, oh yeah, that was off, right? So Smith Wigglesworth said, some people read in Hebrew, some people read in Greek. I like to read my Bible in the Holy Ghost. And I would agree with that. That's a good one. All right. So, uh, so uh, yeah, this question, so when a Christian shoots an abortion doctor, is that love? Well, let me ask you, Tyrannosaurus Rex, about this question. Let's say there was a madman who just shot 50 innocent children, okay? And then he says out loud, I'm going to shoot 50 more. And you're across the street with a sniper rifle, and you see him headed towards another playground with 50 innocent children. Would you think it was love to let him carry out his evil plans? Or would you think that love would take necessary force to defend the innocent children? If you could answer me, I'd appreciate it. The Bible condones slavery and genocide. So this is a great question. Um, the Bible is, is the Bible is progressive revelation. okay? It doesn't mean that God changes, but how he deals with mankind changes. For sure, there's an old covenant, there's a new covenant. In the new covenant, Jesus gives a very simple rule on how we relate to others. It's called the golden rule, and it destroys slavery. It destroys any, any evil institution is dismantled by the golden rule. Remember, the golden rule says, treat others as you'd want to be treated. So you can't have slavery, like forced slavery. Now, you can have employee-employer. I've been, I've enjoyed being an employee as I'm learning and the person's paying me well and I, you know, they're not forcing me to be there and I choose the job, right? That's a good thing. Praise God. So it's not like it doesn't, you know, but just involuntary relationships that are aggressive and coercive. Well, that breaks the golden rule, which is why taxation, of course, is illegitimate because you're being forced to pay for something against your will. It breaks the golden rule, right? So I believe the Christian uh, social principle is called the golden rule. And it does dismantle slavery or any kind of inst institution that's evil. Okay, there are there are evil institutions. What do I mean by that? There's institutions that operate with evil, written evil protocols, like the, the state. The state is an evil institution. Why? Not because the people are evil. The protocols are evil. They, it survives on taxation. And taxation is the forcing you to pay for something against your will. That breaks the law of God, right? You shall not steal, right? So taxation is theft, of course, right? So you have all sorts of problems. Like that institution 
breaks the golden rule. And so it can, it's not compatible with, with Christianity. Now, there's a whole, there's all sorts of stuff that is interesting. Like, why didn't Paul just condemn slavery? Why didn't he just come out and say, hey, slavery is evil? Well, in a sense, the Bible is very practical. And because slavery did, in fact, exist and it was widespread, what Paul did was give spiritual advice that would free the slave to actually become free even in the confines of slavery. When he said, slaves, submit to your masters as unto the Lord. It actually freed the slave to be totally free in the spirit of the Lord. And then once you're totally free inwardly, it doesn't matter where you're at. That's why Paul's on prison cells and he's rejoicing. He writes the happiest letter in the whole Bible while he's in jail, you know, because he was free in the spirit of the Lord. So it didn't matter what was going on. And so in a sense, remember that the apostles, the, 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 the epistles in particular, the, the, the letters written to Christians, they're meant to free your soul. And of course, that freedom in the soul will manifest and lead to freedom in every arena as it's embraced by a culture or a people. I hope that helps. Um, Outbreak says, yet yeah, you vote GOP. No, we don't. I, I mean, I don't vote. So I, don't, I just don't agree with the, the, the I don't. I don't go into the realm of politics at all because it's it's antithetical to the kingdom of God in my in my humble opinion. Okay. Uh, KGB God is not as loving as in the NFL. Get Larry says, and I I understand what you're saying there. You know, I would just say if you can hear the tone, if you can hear the shepherd's voice, you can hear things the right way, and they do become. But I understand what you're saying there. Yeah. Yes. Uh, didn't Jesus say, Jesus say, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's? That's exactly right. So when the, when the Jews, the, the, the Pharisees were trying to trap Jesus with a question, which means all the Jews knew taxation was illegitimate, right? So they're trying to trap him because if he says, no, you shouldn't pay taxes, they're going to kill him, right? So that's the point of the question was everybody knew the answer. So they're trying to trap Jesus. He didn't just answer yes and no though, did he? He said, show me a coin. Whose face is on that coin? He could, he, Jesus didn't just answer people that were trying to test him or trap him like the way they wanted to be answered. Remember that guy, if you were on last night, I had this guy on AT who just, he wasn't interested in a conversation. He was trying to trap me, right? He was trying to trap me. And so he was super frustrated when I wouldn't just answer his questions because he wasn't actually honoring me at all. He was just trying to trap me, right? And so, you know, Jesus didn't just answer people like they wanted to be answered. He would ask questions or he would confuse people. And in this case, he teaches the truth. He says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. Well, that begs the obvious question, what is Caesar's and what is God's? And the obvious answer is Caesar owns zero. God owns everything, right? Again, the obvious answer to anybody, to, to anybody listening who has ears to hear, Caesar owns zero. God owns everything, <laughs> Okay, so that Jesus answered correctly, but he didn't answer in a way that would have got him killed because, you know, the centurions listening to that were going, hmm, I think he said give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Okay, yeah, <laughs> just like a lot of people today do, not very bright. And I'm not saying you, you're that, but, pe you know, people today say, well, no, he said give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Yeah, but then he said give to God what is God's, and that doesn't mean everything. It doesn't mean that Caesar can just walk out in his balcony and say, I own that sheep over there. That's my sheep. You know that country over there? That's my country. Oh, this lake? It's my lake. He doesn't just by decree own everything that he looks at. That's ridiculous, right? The whole thou shalt not steal assumes private property rights. You can't steal something if you can't own something in the first place, right? So that begs the question, how do you own something? Well, voluntary trade or original appropriation, right? Homesteading, original homesteading. You, took, you went into the forest and grabbed a tree. Nobody else grabbed the tree, so it's your tree if it wasn't on anybody's property, right? Makes sense. It's not too confusing, right? So yes, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, but the, that begs the question, what belongs to Caesar? And the obvious answer is n nothing, right? I mean, or, or at least not, not, not the things he's claiming, right? But then what belongs to God? And the obvious answer, of course, is everything. And that's the principle Jesus wants you to know. Give everything to God. Woo! I'll be, I'll be preaching if I keep going down that road, but if you'll give everything to God, you'll never lack in any way. Praise God. All right. Any other questions? Uh, Bible or going to church? Do you believe a person can be a Christian without the Bible or going to church? Larry, that's a great question. The answer is, the answer is yes. Anybody who calls out in the name of the Lord shall be saved. But a follow-up question or a follow-up um, exploratory uh, idea, in a sense, that I want to plant in your spirit is when you're 
a new creature in Christ, it says that you're a member of a body. And so let's say you're the thumb. The thumb laying by itself on the table is not a useful thumb. And I'm not saying God's going to throw you out, you're going to go to hell. I'm just saying you're not going to find your purpose and you're not going to find your life and your health and your strength disconnected from the body. So it, my encouragement, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a pastor of a local church, right? But I see this day in and day out. Many people just, especially men, they want to be independent. Ah, yeah. They've been burned before by religion. They don't want to go and submit to leadership. They, you know, they're, they're very, they're rebellious. And, and I'm not, again, I struggle with this a lot. I'm not trying to condemn. I'm just saying it will really hurt you if you can't submit to leadership, if you can't come in and be a part of that body. God put the body there for your own good. In fact, again, that thumb laying on the table, it never even knows what it's supposed to do until it's connected to the hand. But once it's connected to the hand, all of a sudden, boom, it finds its function. So a Christian that's disconnected from the body is a fruitless Christian. By the, by the, you know, and, and we don't want to be fruitless, right? We want to be connected to the body and we want to produce fruit or bear fruit that he's produced, right? He's the vine, we're the branches. The vine, the vine produces the fruit, but the branch bears the fruit. Stay connected, abide in me. And of course, we are the body of Christ as living stones in a living temple. So I would just encourage you, if you're if you haven't found a local church, seek one out. It's 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 not because you have to, it's because you get to. It's 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 a privilege to dwell and to fellowship with other Christians. It really is. It'll really, really help you. I'm gonna end the uh, broadcast for Gab and everybody on the recording, but I'm gonna stay live to answer more questions. Just bear with me one second. God bless you, Gab and BitShoot and all of our friends on other platforms.